Good morning. So hey, before I get started on my journey this morning, I want to read this. I don't want to read this while I'm driving. But touching upon false teachers, false prophets, um, preachers, prophets, teachers, false, you know, false doctrine, riding along with that. I want to tell you some more about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I'm going to talk about money this morning and how the Pharisees and the Sadducees, about their, their plans, their ploys, all the ways they had to make money inside the temple. It was all about the money. And I'm going to tell you about that in a second. But I'm going to read this to you. Matthew 21, 12. And Luke is just like it. But Matthew 21, 12. Jesus entered the temple courts. Okay? The temple. There, there was a, a large front patio, if you will. Huge front patio. It was the temple courts. And drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Jesus says, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. Luke 19, 45, when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Okay, let me get rolling here. So I can pay attention to the road. Everything the religious teachers of the law did in Jesus' time, everything was centered around making money. everything. They used God's law and they manipulated God's law to make money for themselves. It was written in the law, you can find this I believe in Leviticus, but when you would sin as a, as a Jew, as a practicing Jew, before Jesus' time, when you would sin, there would be a certain sin offering that you would have to sacrifice in order to atone for your sins. And God specifically put in the Bible, there will be certain types of birds, certain types of animals that will cover certain types of sins, okay? The really big sins, the bad sins, the ones that are that are really get you in a whole lot of trouble would require a larger animal. You'd have to give a larger sacrifice, which the Jews put more value on. Okay, not all Jews were farmers. But as we'll find out from reading about the Sadducees, the Pharisees, these guys had all types of sources of cash flow. If you're familiar with that term today, cash flow, it's what it's all about, especially here in the United States. It's all about cash flow, having multiple sources of easy money cash flow. And the Jews weren't any different. So. Those who were buying and selling doves. So one of the requirements that God had about these animals and birds that were being sold and sacrificed, the animals and birds had to be perfect. They had to be without blemish. Well, where do you get a perfect, blemishless bird or animal? Well, you breed them. You breed them. And specific birds, specific animals are going to come from specific breeders. And that's exactly where the Pharisees, they had a, they had a, a little business going on. They had a side hustle going on. They, it was extortion. They would breed so-called perfect animals. And to get a perfect one, you had to pay top dollar 
to get a perfect one. So, ironically, and I hadn't planned on saying you know anything about this, but I've talked about it before. When you had when you had a lamb that you had to sacrifice, the perfect lambs to sacrifice, those came from a specific town in Israel. A special town is where the sacrificial lambs were bred. Guess which town that was? Bethlehem is where the sacrificial lambs were born. Coincidentally, that's where Jesus was born, was Bethlehem. So, and all that was planned. Okay. So let's go back to those who were buying and selling doves. Doves were a very common sacrifice for a very common sin. Moved up lambs, sheep, cattle sometimes for the really big ones. Now here's another way that the Jews made money. Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers. Okay? Right there in scripture, he overturned the tables of the money changers. Well, why were there money changers? What were the money changers for? The Jews were under Roman authority. And before Roman authority took over, the Jews had their own authority. Okay? Which means they had their own money system. They had their own coins. The Jews declared, even under Roman authority, that they can't have Roman coins inside the temple the coins inside the temple have to be pure coins. They have to be Jewish coins. And obviously, since they're in the temple, they're going to be worth a whole lot more money than the Roman coins. And who, who established that rule? Who established how much more the Jewish coins were worth than the Roman coins? The Jews did. Okay? The religious teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. So you might have a Jewish copper penny that the Jews said were worth more than a Roman gold coin or the equivalent. And since you had the sin and you wanted to be right with God, and you had to pay for the sacrificial animal. You had to pay the price. You had to come up with the price. Some way, somehow, you had to come up with that price. Thus created the whole atmosphere for a small market in the temple courts. The Jews had thousand, at least a thousand years, 1,500 years, to come up with ways to use the laws of God to put money in their own pockets. Okay? It's all about the money. And that's what I've been talking about this week and last week. The love of money is the root of many evils. And people, it's not just the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's not just modern day preachers and modern day televangelists and modern day pastors. It's us. It's every one of us. Jesus knows our hearts. All across the world, he knows our hearts. Greed. Greed is in every one of us. We need to check ourselves constantly, check ourselves, check our motives.
Why are you doing this? Why are you seeking out God? Are you really seeking out God or are you seeking money? Do you want to live for God and live for God's will? Or are you just looking for another way to make a little cash, to make a little living? Father God knows what we need. He knows what we need long before we know what we need. The basic tenets of survival. You know, this I've, I've got this thought on my mind. I want to talk about it. i got to get on the big road here, but I'm going to tell you a story. Here's a story, a quick story. Out in the country, in Indiana, out in the country, to find water, you have to dig a well. You have to run a pipe into the ground, I'm going to get off the big road here, get over here in my, uh, my nook. You have to run a pipe into the ground to hopefully hit the water table. If the pipe isn't very long, you can usually do that, do that yourself. Hammer a pipe, an iron pipe down into the ground, maybe, I don't know, eight feet at first. Throw on a coupling, throw another eight feet on and continue to drive that pipe down on the ground until you hit water. At which point you hit the water table. Hopefully you don't have to go very deep. But you pump and you pump and you pump and you get water. Okay? Well this young man moved out to the country, dug his own well, had enough to drink, but then he decided he wanted to build a house. So he builds this house. Naturally, he's gonna have a kitchen, he's gonna have a bathroom, he's gonna have a laundry room, a place to do his laundry, and it's a hand pump well. So to get water, he has to pump the water out of the ground, okay? Well, it doesn't take long for the water table to move downward because he's using a lot of water. So he builds his house, he gets all this down, pretty soon he finds himself out of water. So he's gonna have to chase that water, so he thinks, and pound more pipe down into the ground, go deeper. Well, now, instead of hitting topsoil, he's hitting clay which he has to work a lot harder to get that pipe down inside the ground. He's having to pump more and harder, but he's not getting any water. So he gets more pipe, drives deeper, finally hits water. It's good to go. Now he can take care of his house. So he's driving around the country, and he sees somebody's got a hot tub. Well, he wants a hot tub. Well, he's going to have to fill that hot tub with water. Where does he get the water? He's got to get it out of the well. Hand pump. Pumps, 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 pumps. Water table lowers. Gets that thing filled, but now he's out of water. Now he hires a well drilling company. Spends money to pump more water out of that well. Gets his hot tub filled, 
sees somebody with a swimming pool, now he wants a swimming pool. So he's got a house, got a well, got the hot tub, got the swimming pool. It goes on, you know, it just goes on. He desires, he may not need it, but he desires more water, more water, more water. And the water table continues to fall, fall kind of like California. That's what's going on in California. It has been for years. The, uh, <laughs> the valley in California where they grow all kinds of vegetables, it's sinking. You can find videos on that on YouTube where the ground is literally sinking because they're pumping all the water out of the ground. And I mean, just thousands. Supposedly, the water that's coming out of the ground in California is thousands of years old. That's how much water they're using to water the vegetables that they grow to feed the country vegetables. And ironically, most of those vegetables get thrown away. They, they get tossed in the garbage. It's, it's unbelievable how wasteful the United States is. We are a wasteful country. A lot like Rome was back in its day. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting off on, a, on another subject there, but this young man became a slave to his debt to chase his own desire. Instead of stopping what he was doing, being happy with the water he had, and waiting for the water table to rise back up to its former level, which it will if you give it time. But we think that we've got to work harder, dig deeper, go into debt to dig deeper, to chase that water, and we don't if we'll follow King Solomon's advice and just stop and wait. Stop and wait for nature to take its course and for the water table to rise. There are many, many, many applications that that story can be applied to. You may not need it, you may want it, you may desire it, you may covet it, but you don't need it. Learn how to be happy with what you have. And move on. Don't be greedy. Okay? The Apostle Paul learned how to be content. Content in all situations. And that's an important lesson to learn, being content in all situations. Back to the Jews and all their money-making schemes. You know, mega churches today You've got uh, you've got speakers writing books, supposedly. I've heard some of these mega preachers say that well, they don't they don't keep the money that the church pays them. They don't they don't keep 100% of that. Maybe some of them only keep 10% and give 90%. And they let everybody know that. They give 90% of what the church pays them away. But they'll keep 100% of what they make on all of their book sales, their DVD sales, their guest speaker arrangements. Um, maybe they're asked to go and you know speak someplace in front of a large audience somewhere. Well, there's a fee for that. They keep that. But they give away most of the money that the church pays them. 
They're multi-millionaires. You know, to me, it's all about the money. And I just... I want to stay as far away from that as I possibly can. Check their motives. You know, it's... When you're looking for a spiritual leader, check their motives. Because Jesus talks an awful lot about money and people's love of money. And that's probably, that's a big hurdle. That's a big one. You know, you can't love both God and money. For you'll end up loving the one and detesting the other. Check their motives. If your mentor, if your religious leader is all about the money and you're training up under him, guess what he's teaching you? You're going to be just like him. this one short today and get off here um, have a blessed day be a blessing to somebody's life today and uh, we'll, uh, we'll catch you tomorrow